The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com and by the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. In 1559, Spanish conquistador Don Tristan de Luna sailed into Pensacola Bay with 1,500 colonists aboard a fleet of ships. They intended to establish the first permanent European settlement in what would become the United States, but a violent hurricane altered those plans. Well, the fleet originally entered the bay in mid-August. Um, they presumably searched around and eventually found the perfect spot where they wanted to set up this first town, which would eventually have, in theory, about a hundred families residing here. Um, and they spent the next five weeks probably clearing the forest and beginning to set up uh, streets and house lots, build structures. They kept all of their important food on the ships, which of course was the safest spot until they built on land. So this was all ongoing, and they were, of course, in the process of establishing this settlement when a massive, I mean, based on what we know, it was a really massive major hurricane came in from the east and absolutely devastated the fleet. There were 10 ships still at anchor at the bay. Uh, of that fleet, seven were destroyed. Six went down in the water somewhere offshore here. Another was pushed inland, and all that was left were three ships. And as a result, they lost the vast majority of their surplus food, uh, and they had mouths to feed. They had 1,500 people in a, a village that hasn't even yet at that time been fully constructed. They were without food. They were without local Indians to borrow or buy food from, and they were in really dire straits. And they furthermore didn't have more than three ships afloat. And they sent one back to Veracruz to tell the Viceroy, send help. They sent another two back to Havana so that they could eventually pick up supplies and bring them back. But from that moment onward, the Luna expedition was transformed from uh, an exploratory venture, you know, the establishment of a colony, to essentially a, a rescue mission. The Viceroy wanted to keep the expedition moving and, and didn't want to retreat, uh, but the colonists who were here were really in bad shape. And so the rest of the expedition is all about keeping them alive. Uh, despite great odds and the squabbles between leadership and settlers eventually got sort of reached a crisis point. Well they had unloaded a lot of the supplies to build the settlement and they we assumed they were going to follow normal Spanish plans for a settlement that would have a plaza and, a, and public buildings and a church and, and a special house for Luna in the high status areas. Um, but because the hurricane hit after only 30 days, we were pretty sure they didn't get much of that built. Um, and they left their food supplies on board the ships um, because they hadn't built a warehouse yet. And because most of the ships sank, they lost all their food supplies. So we assume over time, we know that they were resupplied out of Veracruz and, and Cuba. Um, so we assume they were able to build some kinds of structures. They, there's reference 
uh, to the warehouse being built and a, being a secure building. There's references to a church, which you would expect from in a Spanish colony to be a priority, but we know that building was not a substantial building. They called it a ramada, which implies it had a roof but no walls. Um, so they didn't build much as far as we can tell. And we're hoping the archaeology again will reveal what actually happened because the records aren't very clear about that. While historical documents provide a lot of information about the intensity of the hurricane that sunk Luna's fleet and the difficulties that the colonists faced, the exact location of the attempted settlement has remained a mystery until now. Former University of West Florida archaeology student Tom Garner was driving through a Pensacola neighborhood when he saw a cleared lot where a house had been torn down. For 30 years, Garner made a practice of investigating such sites to see if any artifacts might have been uncovered. This time, Garner's curiosity was rewarded. The initial artifact that I found was what's called an olive jar. It was a fragment of a neck from an olive jar. These are large ceramic storage jars for food, and they're, they're very, very common, one of the most common artifacts on Spanish colonial sites. And I understood that that could potentially be Luna. We're, we're you know, in a nice spot close to the shipwrecks. Um, but olive jars also go, you know, as late as maybe 1800 or so, so it wasn't necessarily Luna. I contacted um, someone I knew at the University of West Florida Archaeology Department, and um, she got in touch with the archaeologists, and they came and confirmed what it was. The discovery of Spanish colonial artifacts in a quiet Pensacola neighborhood put to rest the long-running debate about where the Luna settlement was located. Professional archaeologists and archaeology students from the University of West Florida began searching for more remains of the attempted colony. This site uh, is really remarkable and distinctive in a number of different ways. Um, so when Tom Garner found the artifacts that he found, which were mid-16th century, um, the first thing that we noticed, of course, was that the artifacts themselves predate most of the, well, all of the other uh, Spanish colonial material that we have in other parts of Pensacola. So Pensacola's got three successive 18th century presidios. So that material culture is well known. This stuff is very distinctive and very different and it is not found in great quantities anywhere on the northern Gulf Coast. So 16th, mid 16th century artifacts and not just a few. It is the biggest assemblage of mid 16th century Spanish artifacts in all of southeastern North America, except for St. Augustine, Florida, and Santa Elena or Paris Island, South Carolina, the other two 16th century colonies. So, um, so that's part of it is that it's the right date, which there shouldn't be anything like that else on the Gulf Coast. It's in the immediate vicinity of the two known shipwrecks that we do have that we also have identified with Luna. And even more importantly than that, we have mostly ceramics, mostly pottery. And that's not what the Spaniards traded to the Native Americans. So all over the Southeast, all over North America, Native Americans ended up with little glass beads and bits and pieces of metal, metal chisels, etc. What we have on this Luna site is many hectares worth, hundreds of meters long and wide, of residential daily debris from mid 16th century Spaniards. Um, and it's exactly the stuff you'd expect. One of the clinchers about identifying this, not just as a Spanish settlement, but as the Luna settlement, is the fact that in and amongst literally hundreds and hundreds of pieces of Spanish olive jar and plates and other things, we have a reasonably robust assemblage of coarse earthenware that's red filmed for the most part and has this graphite black line paint on some outside kind of a decorations. It's Valley of Mexico 16th century Aztec tradition pottery. And you don't find Aztec pottery in the Southeast. There was only one expedition that brought documented substantial numbers, in this case a couple of hundred Aztec Valley of Mexico Indians to Florida, and that was the Luna expedition. Well, we're finding um, broken pots is the main thing. Uh, that they, they brought their supplies in jars and in barrels. The wood from the barrels would have rotted away. Uh, we might expect to find uh, metal bands, iron bands that secured the barrels, but so far we haven't found any barrel bands. But we found lots of broken pots, and a lot of these are 
large containers that were used to store and ship liquids like olive oil, wine, vinegar, water, um, and those pottery vessels break easily if you drop them and shatter into pieces that never dissolve. They, they're always there. So we're finding a lot of broken olive jars is what we refer to the vessel, vessel shape as. They also brought um, plates that were typical of the era that they would have served off of and those have a typical uh, tin glaze on them. They're white colored plates called Columbia Plain and we're finding those here and there on the settlement but not nearly as frequently as the olive jars. They also used uh, coarse earthenware vessels that were made out of a red clay and had a lead glaze on them and we're finding fragments of those vessels around. What we hope to be able to find are areas where different segments of the colony, there were 1,500 people, uh, we hope to be able to find areas where different groups lived together um, after the hurricane. So we would expect that the single soldiers might have camped out together and eaten together. We would expect that the families that were here would have been units that lived together. Uh, Luna brought Mexican Indians with him that we refer to as Aztecs. Um, and so we'd like to see if the Aztecs were integrated into the Spanish community or if they had their own separate area uh, where they lived. Um, but we're, we're way far away from being able to see that. We haven't found the boundaries of the site yet. We're still trying to find the edges of where these artifacts are distributed. We are taking the bags of artifacts that have been excavated, bagged very carefully and marked, and um, we're taking those bags of artifacts and rough sorting them. In other words, we're getting out the dirt. We are uh, sorting the artifacts into different types of material, like we'll make a pile of glass, we'll make a pile of 16th century ceramics, we'll make a pile of brick, we'll make a pile of rocks. And um, then we'll bag those individually. These rough sorted materials will go back to my lab and the trained UWF lab crew will work through each bag and work down to identify each and every artifact that's in those bags. While excavations on the terrestrial site of the Luna settlement didn't begin until 2016, Luna shipwrecks were first discovered in Pensacola Bay in the early 1990s. A barge anchored in the bay provides a base for underwater archaeologists searching the murky water for artifacts. Well, the discovery of the Emanuel Point ship, the, the first one in 1992, was hugely important. Um, for one thing, it established uh, the oldest shipwreck to be found and excavated under academic uh, context uh, in Florida. So it's, it's a very, very important ship just on its own. And gradually they built up enough evidence to realize that it was part of Luna's fleet which of course meant a number of things. Number one, it connected the shipwreck uh, and all of that was coming off the shipwreck with the Luna expedition, which of course at that point nobody knew where the terrestrial site was. Um, but in addition, it meant that there were more ships in the immediate vicinity that might be found. And so that's what led to the eventual involvement of the University of West Florida in continuing searches after the first ship was found. Uh, and eventually, of course, in 2006, a second ship was identified and we've been uh, as an institution really focused on developing research and training students and really, really getting a lot of information to parallel the two ships. And of course now that we have the land site, we can compare what's on the ships uh, as compared to what's on land. And it's an amazing combination of resources, terrestrial and maritime, 16th century Spanish colonial uh, expedition, all in one place under a single institution and scholarship that's been building over the course of decades. I, I'm just so excited at what we're gonna be learning here. Today, Don Tristan de Luna's misfortune is providing amazing research opportunities for archeologists and archeology span students at the University of West Florida. Field schools are being conducted on land at the Luna settlement site and underwater where the sunken ships are located. When this wreck was discovered in 2006, one of the first things that we uncovered was a piece of lead sheathing uh, like this. 
which was really exciting because this is the type of material that they used in the 16th century on the Spanish shipwrecks. And so these long strips of lead were tacked with, with iron tack holes over the seams of the ship to keep the caulking in place like that. So we'd already been working for years on the first Emanuel Point shipwreck, and so when we started finding very similar artifacts of that, we were quickly able to you know, say with confidence that this was the second ship from Luna's fleet. And so we find a variety of things like that as well. And then we find um, a lot of ceramics. Um, and most of these are broken ceramics, but they're 16th century type ceramics and they're, they're Spanish. And so uh, we find large pieces sometimes. And uh, so this is a, um, what we call olive jar, but they're big storage jars uh, from the time period. This particular one's interesting because the inside is coated with uh, a resin here. The Spanish called it Pez. It's actually pine pitch. And we know that this was used on any of these big jars that they carried liquids in. So they're called olive jars for good reason because they carried olives, but they carried olive oil. They put wine in them as well. They could carry water. And uh, so we find hundreds and hundreds of these fragments of olive jar. This is one of the, the rims to an olive jar, and so to seal these off, then a cork, and we found the corks as well that would have been placed in the neck of the jars. And then typical from that time period, this, if you can imagine coming out, this is a big flat bottom serving bowl called a bassine with this beautiful lead uh, green glaze that still, you know, survives quite well to today. And then uh, this is an escadilla, which is, it's a little uh, bowl, uh, that the Spanish would have used for eating stuff like this. It's a type we call Isabella polychrome. You can still see the faint remains of what would have been blue lines on a white background would have been really pretty at the time. Um, you know, for food remains, we find uh, animal bones. Uh, we found cow, pig, sheep or goat. We found chicken bones. And uh, quite surprisingly, uh, a couple of the vertebrae that we found were identified as from a cat. And so we know there were rats on board, and there were also mice on board. We've identified those, but obviously they had a ship's cat. And uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, if a captain preferred a dog or a cat, and is this the first, you know, was this cat carried from Spain? So we've actually sent the vertebrae of that cat, ver uh, the, the bone, to Brussels, Belgium, to the Ancient Cat DNA Project. And they're going to try to extract the DNA from us and tell us more about that cat. So I'm kind of excited about that. We expect to find certain artifacts like the ceramics and such like that. And even when we find this is a stone cannonball and this was hand pecked out of limestone. And between the two wrecks, Emanuel Point 1 and Emanuel Point 2, we've probably found about 20 of these so far. We don't have the cannons. The, can the cannons were salvaged by the Spanish, but we do have lots of the different types of ammunition. So we know what type of weapons were on board. But what I really like and get excited about are the items that kind of have a personal touch that tell, you know, there's something about the story. And so uh, this is, you know, a wooden spoon, but it's probably made out of olive wood. But this would have been a sailor's very likely personal spoon that he carried with him that he would use to eat. They didn't have forks and they probably had a knife and a spoon and that's what they did. Um, I would have loved it if he would have put his initials in it, but he didn't put his initials in this one. And, and this is one that I like to, to talk about as well because, you know, obviously it's a brick. It's a Spanish brick called a ladrillo. But what I really like about this brick is it has a thumbprint in it. And you can see exactly when this brick was still soft, a Spaniard or someone in Mexico, anyways, picked this brick up and left his mark in that. So I appreciate things like that as well. The discovery of the Luna Settlement site on land within view of the underwater archaeology barge helped lead to the discovery of more Luna shipwrecks. A third and possibly fourth shipwreck were identified shortly after the terrestrial settlement site was located. Originally, at least I thought that the shipwrecks had just been driven to their location by the storm. And I work in downtown Pensacola and I thought, well, that's probably where Luna landed because it's so important today and therefore the ships were not anywhere close to the settlement. Um, but as it turns out, the settlement is on the land right next to where the shipwrecks are. So that kind of changed our thinking about uh, how to find additional shipwrecks. We know there's four more out there and we'd been looking and the, the two shipwrecks that we have are in 12 feet of water. So we had been surveying in 12 feet of water around that area. But now that uh, we know that the 
the settlement was right next to the shipwrecks, were looking in shallower water for some of the smaller ships. When Don Tristan de Luna sailed into Pensacola Bay on August 15, 1559, he had a grand plan for expanding Spanish holdings in the New World. Tristan de Luna was here uh, at the directive of the Viceroy of New Spain, who had been directed by the King of Spain to establish the first successful Spanish colony on the Atlantic coast, uh, which was to be at a place that they'd long wanted to be at, which was called Santa Elena, which is modern day Paris Island, South Carolina. So the original objective was to establish a, a foothold for Spain on the Atlantic coast. The Viceroy, on the other hand, working with Tristan de Luna, made a plan to come across the Gulf of Mexico and establish a beachhead at Pensacola Bay, which was called Ochuse at that time, then go inland with a, an army of soldiers, go to a, a province, a native province called Cusa, and then descend the Appalachian Mountains to the coast of the Atlantic. So in, in, in a sense, Luna's goal was to establish a colony on the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico, cross the inland, and then connect New Spain through Pensacola with the Atlantic coast. And it would have been a phenomenal achievement. It would have extended New Spain, modern Mexico, all the way across the southeastern United States. Of course, we all know it failed, but the plan at least was sound. Don Tristan de Luna could not have predicted the violent hurricane that would sink his fleet of ships and diminish the supplies needed to realize his ambitions for Spain. The remnants of his failed effort are providing exciting archaeology field school opportunities for students at the University of West Florida. Well, we have a field school every summer, and because we have an underwater archaeology program, which is kind of unique, um, lots of students come to us for that. Um, and so that's just automatic that we have the underwater field school. We also have a land-based field school or a terrestrial field school. Um, and we have more terrestrial students and more terrestrial faculty. So we've tried it. We've been having about multiple sections of the terrestrial, but just one of the underwater because uh, our dive platform, our barge, only holds so many people. And so we can't overload that for safety reasons. So, in fact, what we've had to do is take the Maritime Field School and divide it into two different sessions. So the students take, have five weeks doing shipwreck work and then five weeks on the land. Um, that prepares them to go into the profession of archaeology because they're trained in both environments. And so they can get jobs with a bachelor's degree in archaeology. Um, there aren't too many jobs in underwater, but there's a lot of jobs in terrestrial. Um, so the field school is a very important part of our program where we focus on hands-on experiential learning. Uh, you can read about archaeology in books, but that doesn't mean you can go out there and know what to do when you're digging in the ground or how to see like an archaeologist. So we, we give our students a lot of that kind of experience. We have a lab class where they learn to identify the artifacts and know how to label them. Um, we also have an artifact conservation class that's an elective that they can take to learn to stabilize the artifacts that have been in salt water. And a lot of the iron and copper artifacts will deteriorate if you take them out of the, out of the water and expose them to air without desalinating them. Um, so there's a lot of hands-on opportunities that we offer. The exact location of the Luna settlement is being protected for now to discourage amateur looting of the site, but the archaeology work is difficult to miss if you drive through the neighborhood. Carefully dug trenches are apparent in the yards of residential properties. The response in the neighborhood has been beyond our wildest dreams. People are thrilled, they're excited, they're granting us access to their properties. And you've got to understand, Tristan de Luna is this mythical figure in Pensacola. And, and so to find this site is really quite a big deal. And people are, are thrilled to death to be part of this project. Um, the response has been tremendous. Um, there's some bragging going on these days about living in the oldest neighborhood in the United States and so forth. So they've got some bragging rights. It's just been wonderful, just been wonderful. We will be doing laboratory analyses and comparisons with other collections and additional work. I, I, I can't imagine that we will be frankly, ever totally finished with these sites. Um, this district with the maritime and the terrestrial side is gonna provide fodder for research, for publications for literally decades to come. And I'm so excited to be in on the ground floor of uh, the terrestrial side of things.
Don Tristan de Luna's attempted settlement of what is now Pensacola ended in 1561. Four years later, Don Pedro Menendez de Avales did establish America's first permanent European settlement in St. Augustine, but that's another episode. You've been watching Florida Frontiers presented by the Florida Historical Society. Visit us anytime on the web at myfloridahistory.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com and by the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida.